I'd like to talk about this afternoon is a presentation that John and I gave um, at the Object Management Group meeting uh, last month on interconnected health. Um, and we chose to speak a bit about the general topic of mappings, and that's what I will be discussing. Uh, and I will initially make an apology to Edsger Dijkstra. Um, and I would normally ask everyone in the audience to raise their hand if you know who Edsger Dijkstra is. I'm not seeing any here. Um, there may be a few of you out there. Uh, but we'll come back to Professor Dijkstra and, and why I've chosen this particular title for the presentation a little bit later. But this is Jack Bowie. My colleague, uh, John Carter, was unable to be in the conference room with me. He had to go back to the base <laughs> planet. Um, but he is on the call. Uh, so if you have any questions for John, he can also uh, assist in, uh, in the presentation as we go forward. So um, why are we here? Uh, I think, as most of you know, uh, organizations, uh, nations around the world are requiring capture sharing and reporting of healthcare data. Um, and of course, because there's so many wonderful standards out there, um, they're suggesting or requiring uh, the use of those standard terminologies uh, in the reporting of that information, which is all fine and good, except the state is that the current state is that most clinical data today is, in fact, collected in not those <coughs> standard forms, uh, but in a variety of local or proprietary forms. Um, and the problem then is, well, since we have to do that, it's uh, basically a simple matter to just map or translate all that local data to the standards. Seems like an easy enough process. Uh, this is kind of my favorite definition of mapping uh, from Jim Campbell at the University of Nebraska. Uh, the key phrase here is obviously without compromising the primary clinical mission. So how do you really do that without compromising uh, that mission? Um, so we believe that, that at least today, uh, mapping is a requirement for interoperability. All these systems aren't collecting data in standard forms. Um, so we have to somehow get them into those standard forms. Uh, and that's what we define as mapping. Uh, and these mappings then enable the local and proprietary data representations to subsequently be efficiently aggregated, compared, analyzed for decision support, uh, for clinical data analysis, all the other you know, good objectives that we have within the healthcare system. Before I go any further, I would like to provide a clarification. Um, the phrase mapping is used in a variety of ways by a variety of different industries and specializations and um, careers of, of folks that we have around here. Um, for the purposes of this discussion, when we talk about mappings, we're talking about the content of a message, the content of, a, of an information block, and not the structure of that message. Um, so the mapping problem is not solved by having you say, well, we use HL7v3, or we do IHE, or we use XML, or I really like my favorite interface engine, or I use Epic, so therefore I don't have any problems. That's not the mapping problem. The mapping problem is semantic interoperability. Uh, and however pretty the note is that you get, um, if you still owe $1.5 million to the IRS, you still owe $1.5 million to the IRS. Um, and it's important that we understand that it's the content of that message that we're trying to exchange. Okay, so what are we going to try to achieve here? <clears throat> well, first of all, it is not to just dismiss the use of mappings and say how horrible they are and say that you ought to do it a different way. Um, there are reasons why you might not want to always use mappings, but mappings are a reality. We have to figure out how we can use them, how we can develop them. So what we really want to try to do is explain why mappings really have to be created and applied thoughtfully. This is not an automated process. This is not something that you just kind of turn a crank and mappings happen. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what some of those issues really are. 
and we'll describe some app development processes that, um, at least here at Apollon, we found to be uh, effective and efficient uh, in order to achieve those end results. So that's what we're really going to try to achieve today. Now, one of the classic problems is that we'll get an RFP, uh, and this RFP has this wonderful statement in it and says, do you have mappings from SNOMED CT to ICD-10? Uh, do you have mappings from our laboratory catalog to what? Well, we're good business people, and of course we always say yes, um, because that's the right answer, and you don't want to say no. But the reality is a little bit different. Uh, what do they really mean? when they said that? What did they want to do with them? Why did they ask this question in the first place? Those are the questions that we're going to try to address in the presentation so that in the future it's not just a simple matter of saying yes or no, but there's some intelligent observations that can go along with that. So why do many of us believe that, that mapping is hard? I mean, why isn't it just kind of an automatic thing? Um, and it has to do with differences between the data sets that are being mapped uh, and the way those data sets and maps are being used. Uh, so here's kind of a nice little list uh, that we came up with of, of some of the areas of consideration and differences that, that we need to look at um, to see why mapping is perhaps not as easy as some people would like to think it is. And we'll kind of go through these uh, and, and take a look at them with some examples. So differences in scope, and what do I mean by that? Well, uh, first, uh, let's look at the 100,000-pound gorilla or the 325,000-pound gorilla, if you want to look at it that way. Um, SNOMED has a whole lot of concepts in it. It covers a very broad range of clinical findings, clinical procedures, clinical activities, and a whole bunch of things that maybe some people don't think are all that interesting anyway, but they're still in there, and there's 325,000 of them. Um, that's a lot to handle. That's a lot to understand. And then at the other level, HL7 gender has maybe three, maybe five concepts, depending upon how you want to look at it, and that's really not very many, and you'll find everything in between. Um, so to say that I can map X to Y when there are these five orders of magnitude difference between the size of these terminologies, um, you know, well, you got to be careful about how you do that, and you really have to understand what it is you're doing. Uh, granularity is another issue. Um, and here, here's a really nice example that is probably familiar to some of you. Um, let's look at ICD-9-CM, and there's a concept on ICD-9-CM with a code of 78.32, which is limb lengthening procedures, comma, humorous. Well, that's nice, and, and okay, so I, I perform um, a lengthening procedure on the humerus, and I'm going to get paid for that, uh, and here's a procedure that, that you know, is an ICD-9-CM that I want to describe. And the simple problem is to say, okay, well, let's change that to ICD-10-CM. Well, that ought to be pretty easy. It's still ICD. I mean, you know, it's another version. What's involved in doing that? Well, if you look at the gem maps, um, that are the kind of industry standard methodology for translating from 9 to 10, you get this. And this takes a little bit of explanation, but the way you do this is that, okay, the ICD-10 code associated with ICD-9-CM 78.32 are two codes either from the top of the screen or from the bottom of the screen. And here you note laterality. Well, ICD-10 has laterality. They don't have kind of bilateral codes. So first of all, you got to know what side the humerus was. And then once you figured that out, and maybe you have that information, and maybe you don't when you're doing the mapping, uh, then you get to decide, well, you know, I don't have a limb lengthening procedure in ICD-10. I have to code that as a division of the humeral shaft and a supplement of the humeral shaft. So we can't even do it in one code. We got to put both codes in there. Um, and then if you see, you can kind of pick from one of the, the top three and then from one of the lower six, which says you have to say, well, what kind of an approach are you using and what kind of a tissue substitute are you using? So this is a decision tree that you have to go through in order to map from a 
less granular limb lengthening procedures humerus to a more granular ICD 10 CM, which is division of right humeral shaft open approach with supplement right humeral shaft with autologous tissue substitute open approach. That's a pretty big difference in granularity. Another difficulty that we have to kind of figure out. Well, let's look at worldview. Um, ICD is a classification system originally defined for mortality and morbidity. Uh, of course, the U.S. modified it for reimbursement because we know more than everybody else does, but it's still basically a relatively simple classification system uh, for looking at disease. Well, CPT is another classification system, but it's really for procedures and it's really defined for reimbursement. LOINC is a catalog, not much hierarchy there, it's a catalog to fill specific slots in HL7 messages. And that's why it was designed, right? Not for clinical efficacy. And SNOMED CT is a sophisticated ontology that's designed to do everything and solve all the world's problems. Well, okay. I mean, we all know how these things got developed. They locked, you know, an appropriate set of informaticists and physicians in a room for a very long time, and they all come up with the answers for these things. They have different worldviews. They thought about the world differently. They were not done by the same person. This causes complexity. And without an understanding of those worldviews, you can't really do a good job doing mapping. Oh boy, pre and post coordination. Um, complex way of saying how much information do we want to put in a single terminology package or a single terminology concept. Um, we can look at anemia. Well, ICD-9 says, I've got this anemia concept, and it's anemia of mother postpartum condition or complication with that code. Um, okay, I mean, that's a statement. That's a concept. Uh, there's no real rules for kind of combining what is obviously more than one fact in one thing, but somebody thought that was a useful concept. Um, so there it is, and, and we're supposed to use it. Now, like on the other hand, has all kinds of other iron microscopic observation identifier in blood by potassium ferrocyanide stain. Uh, lots of detail, but at least they keep the detail in the same order, if you look at a lot of blunt concepts. Uh, so they do a pretty good job of consistency, but there's a lot of information, a lot of information coordinated in a single blunt concept. Different terminologies do this in different ways. And these are examples of pre-coordination, right? So we have a priori combined some basic things into some more complex things. Well, SNOMED says, hey, I can do anything you can do once, I can do it twice. So SNOMED comes up with a different way of doing it called post-coordination. So they give you a very specialized logic with a complex set of rules um, for combining something called anemia and mother complicating pregnancy, childbirth, and or for a perium with a definitional manifestation of erythropenia in a typical hierarchy, et cetera, et cetera. So you can combine these to your heart's content um, and create very complex SNOMED expressions to identify the, the things that you really think you're looking for. Um, combining features from kind of all the other terminologies in perhaps a good, perhaps a bad way. Use case. I mentioned early on um, the kind of independent of characteristics of the independent terminologies. You kind of got to know what you're doing. I mean, all maps are not equal. Uh, you need to know what is the use case. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to map SNOMED CT to ICD-9 so that you can do, you know, CDC mandated uh, WHO compliant aggregation and reporting of morbidity, or are you doing SNOMED CT to ICD-9 for reimbursement? Well, those are two examples, and you likely have a very different map, depending upon which of those use cases. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about use cases uh, later in the presentation, but as we talk about use cases, you know, these are the questions you have to ask, right? Well, with the audience, why are you doing this? Uh, what's the need? What problem are you trying to solve? What is the direction? Again, very critical. The map from SNOMED CT to ICD 9 CM is probably not the same as the one from ICD 9 to SNOMED. Uh, again, it's a different use case, a different reason. Uh, need to figure that out. What's the granularity do you need? Uh, something kind of general or something very specific? And what is the overall context? Is it a medical record? Is it a CDR? What's really going on? 
I'll, I'll finish up with, with kind of one of my favorites, which is idiosyncr idiosyncrasies. Um, you don't always know what it is you're getting. And there's a classic example uh, that came out of the UK. Uh, a number of years ago, the UK was very interested in converting a number of medical record systems, like the whole country's medical record systems from all the primary care physicians, uh, from a the local proprietary code sets that were in use to SNOBIT CT. Uh, so they hired a consulting organization, and that consulting organization went out and assisted in the conversion of uh, many of the primary care record systems to SNOBIT CT. And so they analyzed the data that they had, and they looked at, at in fact, many of these were electronic medical record systems because the uh, penetration in the UK at the primary care level was very high. So they were able to kind of do that automatically. Um, and doing some of these, they came across one practice where they saw an awful lot of examples of plague. Well, you know, my goodness, we, why are they seeing all this amount of plague? So they you know, went out and they talked to the providers that were in that particular practice. And the response they got from one of the physicians was, oh, yeah, plague. That's what we call toenail fungus. We all know what that means. <clears throat> well, they all did know what it meant because they'd all been doing it for years and years and years in, in you know, some suburb of London. Uh, it wasn't particularly helpful to the mapping process to do that. Um, so understanding what goes on in those kind of local code sets we get and understanding that maybe all is not as we would expect um, is an issue. Now, idiosyncrasies work both ways. There's idiosyncrasies on the source side. There's also idiosyncrasies on the standard side. So Snowman CT has a wonderful concept, non-collision motor vehicle traffic accident involving object falling in or on motor vehicle while in motion rider of animal or occupant of animal drawn vehicle injured event. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, I find it hard to believe that that's going to be a target for any of the mapping exercises that we're involved in, uh, but yet it is a concept in SNOMED and, you know, we go forth and prosper and these terminologies just right with these great examples. And, and here's just another one from ICD-10-CM. Uh, so you can have an initial encounter of being bitten by a turtle, or you can be crushed by another non-venomous reptile. Uh, who knows who decided, you know, one only can think of the U.S. Congress when this comes about as to why these particular concepts were put in these terminologies. But they're there, uh, and they have to be considered. They have to be taken care of. Um, okay, so lots of examples of why these things are hard, why they're all crazy, and, and a few chuckles. But again, this is a reality, and we have to figure out, well, how can we do this better? Um, so really, what is a mapping? And we, use, we throw the phrase around. What are we really trying to achieve? Well, first of all, mappings are not equivalences. And then hopefully I have demonstrated to you that you're not going to find an equivalence in some CT for a concept in ICD-9-CM. Uh, it's not equivalence. We're kind of trying to figure out something that's, that's helpful there. Uh, mappings require a use case. You got to figure out what it is you're trying to do before you do it. And let's be real. Mappings are for computers. Humans don't need mappings. Humans know what to do. They've been doing it for a long time. Um, no physician is going to go off to his friendly little mapping table and figure out how to convert code 1 to code B. Um, they're just not going to do that. So we're doing this work so that computers can do something helpful and of assistance uh, in aggregating and interoperability of data. Um, so we've come up with kind of a, a mouth load phrase called computationally useful correspondences to describe what mappings really are. It's a little awkward, but it's awkward for a reason hopefully helps you remember what we're really trying to achieve. We're not trying to achieve equivalence. We're trying to achieve a correspondence that's useful for a particular example or use case and that's useful for, our, for computers. So it's computationally useful. And that's the way we describe a mapping around here. Okay. Well, I've told you all the problems. I've told you all the difficulties. Um, so what can we do? How do we do things a little bit better than we've been able to do them in the past? Well, we start out 
not surprisingly, because we talked about this already, is define and document. Heaven forbid you should write something down. Document your use case. Um, well, I'm trying to compute compliance with a quality measure. Well, okay, then that implies the way you want to look at the mapping, you way, the way you want to develop that mapping. I want to share data with a partner. Well, we really want to get pretty exact to the extent that we can, and we're anticipating a shared context, right? My partner is probably another healthcare organization or a healthcare provider organization. So there's an assumption about what context is carried around. Um, maybe we're trying to upgrade our information systems. Uh, consistency with previous results, consistency with what you've done in the past is really pretty important. Um, <clears throat> discover some cohort of patient populations in your practice. Well, this has got to be pretty familiar and flexible, right? This may not be something that a PhD informaticist is doing. This may be something that an administrator or, or a clinician or a front desk group was trying to do to understand what's going on, or heaven forbid an MBA, um, that what's going on in your practice. Different use cases create different characteristics. Document this, write this down, understand what it is that you want to do. Unlist an appropriate mapping tool. We said these mappings cannot be done automatically, and, and this is certainly true. Um, <clears throat> but there are tools available that can assist the manual process. This is inherently semi-automated, but let's take advantage of tools where we can. Uh, we have some familiar, familiarity with those, uh, and these are some of the things that we believe a mapping tool, any mapping tool that you would look at, should really support. Um, you don't want to have to do everything one at a time. You know, if the tool can do a whole bunch of things at once, that's really nice. You can go out and get yourself a drink and, you know, kind of take it easy for a while. Um, contextual targets. We talk about SNOMED, it's 325,000 concepts. If you've got a bunch of chief complaint terms, you don't want to try to map that term to 325,000 concepts in SNOMED. Let's figure out what are the diagnosis or the finding concepts of SNOMED and only map to those. Reduce your false positives, get a little more specificity. Seems like a reasonable thing. You ought to be able to support comments. Uh, certainly you ought to be able to support lexical matching, abbreviations, uh, spelling correction, that kind of a thing. Be able to browse and search these terminologies. Uh, share maps between developers. Workflow, complex, simple, less important than, again, the idea that, you know, two heads are better than one, we can really do this a little bit better. And sharing of results and even crowdsourcing of results, as might be available in some products like Term Manager, provides some capabilities to improve the mapping process. So take advantage of tools where you can. Don't try to do it all by hand. We very strongly believe that, that one wants to use a team of mappers. Um, you know, you can say, you know, majority wins. Uh, again, those are processes and, and rules that you set up. But the idea is um, that you want to get more than one viewpoint on this. And But besides that, having some different points of view, some different backgrounds can be very valuable. Uh, in doing team mapping, certainly take advantage of subject matter experts. Um, you got some experts in SNOMED, that's great. You got some experts in laboratory technology, that's great. Take advantage of that. Um, look for experiences in both source and target. Someone that's familiar with that local code system uh, that they're using, they're currently distributing. And also somebody maybe that even has some understanding in LOINC. That would be really great. That makes life a lot better. As we said before, value diversity. You don't want everybody to look the same. Um, and something we've learned for a long time, uh, your highest trained and most experienced person may not be the best person for a mapping task. Uh, look around, see, you want something practical, you want to get results done. Again, value the diversity of members of your mapping team. Touched on this a little bit before, as well as documenting your use case, um, document a style guide. I mean, how, how are you doing these mappings? Um, I mean, many of us in the, in the engineering persuasion realize that no matter how good the engineering specification is, um, every programmer sitting at his desk makes hundreds of little decisions every day as they're coding a program, things that just didn't get thought of or, you know, things that happen. The same way when you're doing mapping, there's a bunch of little decisions that are going to get made, and they're either going to get done arbitrarily or you can document them 
so that people can share it. Well, what happens if you can't find an exact? You go broader, you go narrower. How much broader do you look? How do you go through those processes? Um, documentation and development of a mapping style guide for a project or for a whole organization uh, is an incredibly valuable asset to have. Um, so again, how do we deal with granularity mismatches? Broader, narrower, what do you pick? <clears throat> what do you do with local idiosyncrasies? Well, don't bang your head against the wall. Sometimes you just need to call somebody up and ask because you're not going to know what that strange abbreviation means. Um, do you have hierarchies <clears throat> in your source and on your target? Do you <clears throat> use those consistently? How to do that? An understanding, maybe, that no mapping is better than a bad mapping. In most of the cases, that's true. Um, but again, that needs to be a explicit decision that gets made and needs to get documented. And then finally, there are special cases and things that come up in the course of a mapping engagement and being able to document those if only to describe why you did what you did as an after the fact activity, but also as some of the things to think about when you go about doing this next time around. And finally, in our little recipe set here, um, a little bit about map management. Um, mapping is not something you do once and then you kind of put it on the shelf and you go away and forget about it. Uh, life changes. Uh, source terminologies change. New laboratory tests, new uh, non-invasive radiology tests, new diseases, new drugs get created all the time. Sources change. Targets change in adaptation to that. Um, you need to understand and you need to manage your mappings in this way. Some relevant questions, what's the frequency um, of your target updates? Well, you know, ICD is once a year, and SNOMED CT is twice a year, and RX norm is monthly, and well, what does that mean? Do you remap everything monthly? Um, how do you handle change management in that? Uh, how do you handle changes in the sources? How often does that clinical laboratory that you use update their lab compendiums, their lab catalogs? Um, how frequently? Uh, how about procedures? How about genomic advances? How often do, do those happen? How do you want to integrate those into your mapping process? Um, important things to understand. <clears throat> well, now we've got two things, and oh yeah, gee, by the way, you better figure out how you're going to synchronize those two things, um, because that's just as important as understanding about the two ends. So the management of these mappings is an important activity. Okay, um, so let's finish up. And, and, before you guys go any farther, I want to come back to uh, that original discussion about it. Um, Professor Deister was a, a Dutch computer scientist uh, in the mid-20th century. Boy, that sounds like a long time ago, doesn't it? Um, the mid-20th century. And in March of 1968, believe it or not, um, he wrote an article in the communications of the ACM, Associated in Computing Machinery Journal. Um, that eventually was titled, Go To Considered Harmful. This is a classic paper in computer science, uh, and it criticized excessive use of the, what was then very prevalent, go-to statement in programming languages. Uh, and so if you wanted to, to build a program, you kind of said, well, you're processing along on line 35, and then it says, well, go to line 932. And the program did that, because that's what the go-to statement meant. Professor Dijkstra, rather eloquently described how that maybe wasn't a great thing to do. Um, it didn't allow you to really understand what was going on in the program. It didn't allow you to maintain that program very well. And he introduced the concept of structured programming. Wow. Programming blocks and repeat loops and for loops and all kinds of neat things like that um, that didn't require go-to, the go-to statement. Um, well, as you can imagine, um, this caused a great hue and cry and stir and gnashing of teeth in the computer science community for a number of years. Um, but I think for most of you that are on this call and in the audience have probably never in your lives used a go-to statement. Uh, and the reason is, to a large extent, um, the article written by Professor Dijkstra in 1968. So I'm, again, not describing that we're going to get rid of mappings, and that's not the intent of our little presentation today, but yet it is a reminder um, that we need to do things 
carefully and considerably uh, and really understand what we're doing before we kind of jump into doing what seems like it ought to be a really easy task. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, we're going to follow the Yellow Brick Road to mapping Nirvana here um, and figure out how to do this. So what do you do? Well, think before you ask. If you're creating an RFP and you say, I need a mapping from X to Y, think a little bit about why you need it and, and maybe describe a little bit about what the use case is. Um, that would be a really important thing. Uh, speaking as a responder to RFPs, that would help us a lot. Um, and I would argue that it would probably help you a lot to at least kind of think about that requirement uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, we would certainly suggest you find a good partner to help you with your mappings, uh, someone that has experience with mapping uh, and can, again, lead you down uh, a journey that is going to be successful for you. Going back to uh, Dr. Campbell's original comment, you really want to maintain the clinical integrity. As, as expedient as it can be to say, well, we're really only doing this because we want to get paid, um, try to maintain the clinical integrity. Mappings, like computer programs, tend to be around a lot longer than anyone ever expected them to be. Uh, and you want to make sure that what you're producing is something that has high integrity. A really important consideration uh, that we've come up, which I kind of say, save the verbatim. And that means if you're accepting data, if that source data is in a given local terminology, and what you need is SNOMED, don't just do the mapping, store SNOMED in your database and go away. Um, save what the clinician originally said save what the lab test originally said, save both of those. Save the source and the target, because you're going to need to know that. You're going to need to be able to go back. Uh, having that additional clarity is really important to do. And finally, of course, plan for change. Everything changes. Uh, and it's important that this is a process, a journey, as they say, and not a single destination. Uh, mapping is very much a journey. And we would suggest that you plan and you work very carefully uh, to make sure that these mappings do meet your needs, address your use case, um, and can continue to be used for a much longer time than you might initially expect. So with that, I thank you all. And I would ask to see if there are any questions. Or John, any other comments? That